All right, good morning and welcome to the February 16th meeting of the Atlanta Regional Commission's Land Use Coordinating Committee. My name is Molly Bogle and I'm a planner with ARC's Community Development Group. I will be your moderator and technical producer for today's meeting. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you all of how you can participate, go over a few announcements and see who we have here with us today. Next slide. Well, we're gonna be holding all questions until the end of today's program. We, we've scheduled ample time for Q&A, so don't worry. Uh, throughout each of today's presentations, feel free to put your questions and comments in the chat function. During the Q&A, if you'd rather voice those questions and comments, um, feel free to raise your hand and wait to be called on to speak. Next slide. A few announcements. Uh, the Community Planning Through Arts and Culture RFP uh, is still open. Proposals are due February 22nd. The um, LCI and CDAP applications are due February 28th. Still have a couple more weeks. Uh, RLI uh, applications are due March 15th. And uh, last month, we uh, told you a little bit about um, DCA's local planning success stories and best practices. They are continuing to accept those success stories, so please feel free to submit those. Next slide. Now we're going to figure out who we have here today with us. Um, so I'm going to launch a poll. So which sector do you represent? Uh, public, private, nonprofit, education, or other. All right, we're going to end that. 58% public, 4% private, 13% nonprofit, 0% education, and 25% other. All right, thanks so much for that. We always like to kind of figure out who we have here with us today. All right, on to the good stuff. Today's meeting is centered on historic and cultural preservation at the intersection of Black History Month. Black History Month gives us an opportunity to celebrate the achievements of African Americans and recognize their central role in US history. It's not enough, however, to do this only one month out of every year. Therefore, over the past several years and spurred on by the racial justice movements and inequities further revealed by the pandemic, ARC's community development group has recommitted itself to changing its programs and processes to ensure more equitable participation and outcomes for disproportionately and negatively impacted people, especially communities of color. Experience has taught us that it takes many organizations and individuals to advance the goals of preservation. Today, we'll begin by hearing from Doug Young, Assistant Director of the City of Atlanta's Office of Design's Historic Preservation Studio, as he provides an update of the Future Places Project. This citywide effort includes the recent landmark designation of the Fuller Freedom House and Masonic Building at 1331 Metropolitan Parkway, both central to African-American history within the city. Dr. R. Candy Tate, founder and CEO of Culture Centers International, will then bring these citywide efforts into focus with her overview of the work being done by CCI, a preservation nonprofit with a mission to collect the history of African diaspora businesses, to educate the community through the arts, and to sustain African diaspora legacies through cultural tourism and historic preservation. Finally, visual artist activist Charmaine Minifield will describe a project in action with her overview of the Praise House Project, a multimedia site-specific installation honoring the African-American history in communities. With that, I'll take a moment to provide brief bios of each of our speakers and then turn it over to Doug to begin. Doug Young came to Atlanta from Virginia to attend graduate school at Georgia Tech, where he received a master's degree in city planning from the then College of Architecture, concentrating on community planning and urban design. After starting with the City of Atlanta's Urban Design Commission in 1996 as the, city's, as the agency's historic preservation planner, in 2010, Doug became the assistant director for historic preservation within the, within the Office of Planning, now the Office of Design, and director of the Urban Design Commission. 
Since that time, he has managed all aspects of the Historic Preservation Studio's work, including strategy, policy, operations, communications and community engagement, design review, grants, and technical assistance, as well as all operations associated with the Atlanta Urban Design Commission. He also initiated and is now implementing the city's first comprehensive assessment of the city's historic preservation program in over 30 years, the Future Places Project. Doug considers the complete story of a place or space, its history, as critical as the places and spaces themselves. Only by respecting and understanding all three, the story, the place, and the space, can an inclusive, authentic, and sustainable future be obtained. Dr. R. Candy Tate is founder and CEO of Culture Centers International, Inc., a nonprofit devoted to historic preservation of African diaspora corridors of memory. CCI works to transform communities through the arts and to sustain legacy neighborhoods through project development, fund development, and grant administration. Dr. Tate is chair of the Coalition to Remember the 1906 Atlanta Race Massacre, serves as an executive board member of the Georgia Trust for Historic Preservation and Historic Atlanta. She has placed Fountain Stone Hall and Atlanta Ashby's Street Theater on the Places in Peril and raised millions in grants for African-American projects. Dr. Tate is also the recipient of the 2021 Jenny D. Thurston Memorial Award presented by the Atlanta Urban Design Commission of the City of Atlanta for her scholarship, leadership, and dedication to preservation. And last but certainly not least, firmly rooted in womanist social theory and ancestral veneration, the work of Charmaine Minifield draws from indigenous traditions as seen throughout Africa and the diaspora to explore African and African-American history, memory, and ritual as an intentional pushback against erasure. Her creative practice is community-based as her research and result resulting bodies of work often draw from public archives as she excavates the stories of African-American women-led resistance, spirituality, and power. Minifield recently served as the Stuart A. Rose Library Artist in Residence at Emory University, and through her collab collaboration with Flux Projects, presented her work, Remembrance as Resistance, preserving Black narratives in Atlanta's historically segregated cemetery to honor the over 800 unmarked graves that were discovered in the African American burial grounds. She was recently awarded the prestigious National Endowment of the Arts, Our Town Grant, to present her Praise House project in three different locations in the metro Atlanta area to celebrate the African American history of those communities. Her next Praise House project will be at Southview Cemetery and will honor the victims of the 1906 Atlanta Race Massacre. With that, I will hand the mic to Doug. Take it away, Doug. Uh, thanks, Molly, uh, for that introduction, and, it, and uh, it's really quite an honor to be on the panel with uh, Dr. Tate and um, Ms. Minifield about this kind of work. Uh, they're the ones who are really getting this work done on the ground, so it's it's my uh, opportunity to talk about sort of more generally what the city of Atlanta is doing about historic preservation and particularly some unique uh, actions we've taken in the last couple of years. Let me go ahead, and Molly, I believe that we need to I need to be able to share my screen. Yes, let me take care of that for you right now. All right, go ahead. Can you see that screen, Molly? We can see it, looks great. great. Uh, thank you all uh, for the opportunity to speak today about the city of Atlanta's work related to historic preservation. Um, this is really going to be an update on uh, the Future Places Project, which, as Molly noted, was the first comprehensive analysis of the city's historic preservation work in, in about 30 years. And we thought that it was a high time to do that and, and see how we could get ready for the next 30 years. Before I talk about the future places part, I just want to remind folks again about Atlanta City Design, which is our vision document for the city of Atlanta that hopes to answer the four questions noted here on the on the uh, slideshow. Uh, what will city look like? How do we want it to work? How do we want it to develop? And how do we connect it all together? It's grounded in five core values, equity, progress, ambition, access, and nature. Um, and, you know, the future places project is one of uh, several key studies that were used to uh, flesh out city design and get more specific to different topics. 
But the one thing I wanted to note in Atlantic City Design, which you can uh, you can find online, uh, just Google that term, you'll get a hit on that document. You can read the whole thing for yourself, is this uh, phrase about progress in the city of Atlanta. And um, it says, as we will begin to design our future, the intrinsic value of progress will only be realized when we stand up for people in places that have meaning. So the question is, what are the people in places that have meaning and how do we stand up for them? And that's what we hope the Future Places Project will do uh, to get the city ready for the next uh, generation of historic preservation work. Uh, in short, the City of Atlanta's Future Places Project is an initiative to ensure that Atlanta retains its historic identity as the city moves forward. Identity and place and space are really important to the city maintaining its authenticity. And in fact, um, expanding its authenticity or making that more inclusive along the way. Um, I would note that all the images in the presentation you see today are either historic or present day images of places or spaces in the city of Atlanta um, that uh, either are associated with the work that we've done or we want to include in the work that we've done in the near future. So what, one question that gets asked a lot is why, why do something called the Future Places Project? You know, why, why go to that effort? And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is the city of Atlanta has a, a, a perceived brand about what we're supposed to be about and what we're supposed to do, you know, new, bigger, shiny, uh, fancy. And we think it's important to push back against that brand because that is a conscious decision. It's not inherent to how the city of Atlanta grows and moves into the future. So we think there's another way to look at the city's future, um, and that's through historic preservation and identity and culture. The last time we did this was in the mid-1980s. We, we thought that it, after about 30 years, it was a, a good way to uh, revisit the conversation. Um, we also uh, are we're very concerned, as are others, about the rapid pace of change in the city of Atlanta, both physical change and cultural and identification change. As I mentioned, the Atlanta City Design uh, was part of our uh, background uh, basis for doing this. We also noted that the city of Atlanta itself was impacting historic properties. It has been doing this, of course, for since its founding, but in particular, particularly lately, we thought that it was a more uh, impactful work by the city of Atlanta on its own projects, parks projects, school projects, what have you. So we wanted to be prepared for that as well. There's lots of myths and facts about historic preservation. You all know better than most on this call about what is, in fact, the reality about history, culture, and historic preservation. Um, there seemed to be a bit of a stagnation of the conversation and approach to historic preservation, um, such that we felt it was important to uh, open that up or try to open that up to more voices and more, more folks. And then, of course, helping to figure out what the role of uh, historic buildings and places would be in the city's future. And then, as noted more than once, uh, we hope this will be a roadmap for the next 30 years of the city's historic preservation work. So what was the Future Places Project itself? Um, it finished about two years ago. Um, it in involved engagement of some of the usual folks in the conversation, plus some new ones. We'll talk about that in a little bit as when we get to lessons learned. We did do some informational survey work um, with the public, and that was really quite intriguing because it, it, it involved both a control set of uh, folks who were surveyed randomly using a marketing firm's uh, database, as well as people who were inclined to know about historic predation by coming to our events or um, you know, doing our work online. So we were able to compare sort of the informed or engaged historic preservation person with sort of the random uh, individual in the city of Atlanta and see what kind of different results we got for those, that information. We did do some map work and collected information from other places and cities around the United States. We did do a little bit of field survey work. We did not intend to survey the city of Atlanta, nor do we intend to do that in the near future. This was more an attempt to fill in some of the gaps of places that we weren't, um, didn't have good data on already. We did an extensive and exhaustive study of the city of Atlanta parks system. Um, that included both identifying all the park units in the city of Atlanta that have some sort of historic significance, but also at the same time, uh, documenting how the city's park system is a, a microcosm of the city of Atlanta's history in general. Uh, we created what we call the story of Atlanta, <clears throat> which is not the history of Atlanta. It's a, it's a, our attempt to capture the four or five themes we think make up the city's DNA. So it's a very short um, thematic document, if you will, and that's available on the project's website. And of course, the roadmap for Lies Ahead uh, it was, the, was the general concept of what it was about and what's included in the Future Places project. But more so, as you'll see in today's presentation, it was a, it's an ongoing effort, which is how do we put this into action in everyday city of Atlanta functions. 
uh, from the uh, actual product uh, side, we had a summary report, five and death technical reports. Um, you can see here there are different focuses. Um, we had a call to action, which was the only document we really printed in any sort of volume. It's a small booklet that captures all the recommendations from the Future Places project. Because the project really lives on the project website, atlfutureplaces.com. Um, that includes all of our updates, all of our implementation activity, also um, as a it links to get involved in some of the projects. We did a short project video, which was a, a way to capture the essence of the project in a, in a different sort of way that was locally uh, produced and created by some folks here in Atlanta. Then as you might already tell by the, by the name of the project, it has new branding and messaging. We had new collateral created um, and things that would just sort of bring historic preservation conversations to folks who might not otherwise know that they're talking even about historic preservation. Um, in, in, in a normal sort of setting. But more importantly, what we have now is that we have more questions, we have answers, but we have more questions, which is fine, we expected that. We have new and renewed partnerships with folks around the city of Atlanta. We have uh, lots of ideas for new, new tools and techniques. We'll talk about some of those in a minute. Certainly new conversations. We definitely have new priorities about what should be our focus. And then, as I mentioned multiple times, we have a roadmap for the next 30 years of historic preservation in the city of Atlanta. One of the things I want to share today was some lessons learned before we talk about implementation. You know, things that we learned along the way. Um, we did not expand the conversation enough, in our opinion. Um, that became clear when we looked at our survey results and who was attending our meetings and who was participating in the online activities. Um, we do need to increase the strength of our public-private partnerships. We have uh, taken some steps to do that today, but, but there's more work to be done. We have to act with more urgency related to historic preservation. We need to really be proactive of how to bring these ideas to the forefront and get them into operation within the city of Atlanta's uh, perspective, at least. We need to better explain what historic preservation is now and what it can be and should be in the future. This is particularly related to the myths and facts conversation, but also we found it very clear to us that people are talking about history and culture and identity, and they don't know that they're also talking about historic preservation. And, and further, they don't know the city of Atlanta even has a group that does historic preservation on a day-to-day -day basis. And then likewise, we need to increase the accessibility to the topic and to the discussion. You know, what are the barriers to folks feeling like they're welcome into the discussion and then what mechanisms can we use to actually meet folks on their own terms to talk about this this topic and then as i mentioned breakdown barriers and divides um it's it has become clear to us over the years that that while there are historic preservation folks working at city hall and there are historic preservationists of all kinds and locations in the city of atlanta there is this sort of gap between those two sets of folks and um, we think it's our job to help uh, you remove those dividers, those barriers, so that those can be one and the same conversations. As I mentioned before, we had a call to action, which is the summary of all the recommendations in the Future Places project. Uh, that call to action was grouped into about uh, eight or nine categories of, of recommendations. We tried to organize these more about topics and commonalities versus I mean, operational categories or certainly organizational categories. How the city is organized really doesn't mean much of anything to anybody. They're really concerned about results and, and how they can become involved. So we tried to make it such that it, people could relate to the recommendations from their perspective um, about what history, cultural identity, places and spaces might be about to them. The recommendations themselves, which, are, which we will not go into in depth here, they're all on the project website and they were, uh, we hope, written such that they were more approachable and understandable by folks not in the profession, quote unquote, of historic preservation. Now let's talk about implementation, what we've been able to do to date. Uh, we're gonna talk about five main activities, um, increasing different types of designations by the city of Atlanta, Molly alluded to that earlier. The uh, LGBTQ plus historic context statement, our quick start implementation research from last year, historic preservation week and the Atlanta Cemetery Network. All of these were recommendations coming out of the Future Places Project. So a recent designation activity, um, this is a, a, a very quick list of the properties and places we have been working with since 2018 to become historically designated underneath the city's historic preservation ordinance. In the line there that you see going across the page, 
those are the designations that occurred above that line before the future places project and the ones below are the ones that occurred after we had uh, completed the future places project work. And we're going to talk about all the ones below the line uh, very quickly in just a minute here. But one of the things I wanted to point out um, was the pace of designations that we have undertaken since 2018, in particular in since 2020 as well, um, mostly focused on individual buildings or places and spaces, but um, a few districts as well. And we'll talk about why these designations are a little bit different for the city of Atlanta in the next phase of our presentation. First is the Ponce Highland Historic District. You may have heard about this initiative. It's in uh, Northeast Atlanta, the Ponce Highland neighborhood. Uh, in, in some ways, it's a very traditional historic district for the city of Atlanta, but in many ways, as noted here, it is in fact quite different. Um, it is a comprehensive historic district in that it deals with all the zoning and development activities and criteria in, in, in one place, in one ordinance for the neighborhood. So it's, it's you will, the one-stop shop model. Um, it's very flexible, more flexible than you might suspect for a historic district. Um, includes mixed use opportunities. It includes the option for contemporary design, both for infill and addition work. It includes a variety of residential options, both related to architectural elements in particular, as well as um, focusing on the overall uh, look and feel of a street and overall look and feel of a property versus the, the very specific details about materials and elements. It's very future oriented. Um, it really is looking for to manage change in the neighborhood. In fact, it wants to promote change in certain parts of the neighborhood. It's innovative. It includes new activities um, that have been not done by the city of Atlanta in the past. Um, I would note that historic districts in the city of Atlanta have often been innovators through zoning and, and development practices. Um, there's about uh, a dozen or so types of zoning tools that were first used in historic districts in the city of Atlanta over the last uh, 15, 20 years. It's very focused. Um, it uses as the basis for the future of the neighborhood its historic character and its historic buildings. Uh, it is definitely a historic preservation based approach to managing development. Um, and as I mentioned, it's uh, grounded in those historic preservation principles and concepts, but also embraces some new opportunities for uh, how to create variety in the neighborhood, both physically and uh, development wise. It was very much vetted. It was a long uh, intensive and exhaustive process with neighborhood discussions that included numerous workshops, uh, several walk and talks, several rounds of online uh, and in-person surveys, as well as lots of one-on-one -on -one and small group conversations throughout the neighborhood. And then it was grassroots from that perspective as well as being one of the key items that come out of the Ponce Island Master Plan from several years in the past. So this is a, a if you will, a new kind of historic district in the city of Atlanta. We've all be We've had several neighborhoods uh, approach us about using this model for their uh, potential historic districts um, in the near future. Now I want to talk about some of the designations that we did. Um, first is the Atlanta Eagle landmark building or site. Um, th what makes this a little bit different from other previous designations is that it, it focuses on recent history, including <clears throat> into the early 2000s as being part of the significance for the property. It focuses on LGBTQ plus history, the first such property in the city of Atlanta that has received the designation for that. And then it's also focused as much on culture and identity um, as much as architecture. And for folks who are not familiar with the property, this is on Ponce Leon Avenue in the Midtown neighborhood. The upper left photo shows the front of the property and then the other photos show related images, uh, both uh, activities in the, in the iconic sign at the front of the building as well. The second and companion LBS designation was the Kodak building. Um, this is also unique because it focused on a community icon as well as recent history and signage as a key component of the designation. Again, things that were new to the city of Atlanta's designation efforts. This, this property is right next to the uh, Atlanta Eagle building on Ponce Leon Avenue in Midtown mostly known for its very iconic Kodak dealer sign on the top. This building was long associated with the photography um, business in the city of Atlanta um, for several decades actually. But it also, as well as Atlanta Eagle Building, shows the evolution of the Ponce Leon Avenue corridor from a residential corridor to a um, commercial corridor that we think of it today. Again, very unusual designations in that the architecture was not necessarily the focus of the designation activity. The next one I want to talk about, which Mai mentioned in our opening uh, remarks, was the Fuller Freedom House. Um, this is a, a, an amazing designation, in my opinion, 
Um, it, it's significant because it focused on less recognized, at least the general public civil rights history. It focused on educational and religious history due to the Fuller family's connection to the property. And as with the other two designations, it was more focused on history and culture than the architecture itself. This is an amazing story of a property that if you look at it from the street, uh, as in the center top image here, looks like a, a relatively traditional 1920s, uh, somewhat Italianate house in the old fourth ward, but it has um, this fantastic history related to being a freedom house for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee here in Atlanta. It was also associated with both Stokely Carmichael and John Lewis, who were um, engaged with this house and this property when the transition from John Lewis to Stokely Carmichael occurred um, in, the, uh, in SNCC's uh, you know, evolution in the 1960s. The Fuller family is represented in the lower left-hand corner by Bishop Fuller, uh, one of many generations of Fullers are associated with the property. They were a family that established dozens of churches in the Southeast, as well as several schools, many of which are still in existence today. This also happens to sit, sits also happens to sit uh, across the street from David T. Howard Middle School, which has its own great history in um, role in the city of Atlanta's uh, past and future now as a new expanded middle school. The next donation I want to speak about was the uh, Metropolitan Parkway Masonic Building Landmark Building or site. This is uh, also uh, significant for being lesser known civil rights advocacy. Um, it's a fraternal organization building and it's a community icon being one of the largest I should say one of the tallest buildings in Southwest Atlanta uh, by far on Dill Avenue and Metropolitan Parkway in the Capitol View neighborhood. Here's some images here of that building. You probably recognize it. It's not very far from what will be the Southwest section of the Beltline. It sits on a, on a hill at the corner of Dill and Metropolitan. So it has a lot of visual prominence. But as noted by Molly in her opening remarks, this was also significant because it was the, the regional home of uh, a federal African-American employees uh, union and alliance that advocated for the rights of black postal workers, um, originally and now it's expanded to all federal employees of different uh, uh, occupations and locations. Uh, plus it's connected to the Masonic order. Um, the, the building was built by the Masons and so the upper floors were designed for their use. So it has very specific architectural composition and arrangement. Then the lower floors were uh, uh, leased out to retail tenants and including folks like the uh, postal workers uh, union you see in the lower right hand corner here. Next is the Ormond Avenue Bridge Lamar Building or Site uh, designation. This is uh, fascinating and unique because it's uh, directly related to the city's transportation history and railroad history, which of course is the founding story of the city of Atlanta. And it's uh, related to infrastructure development. In fact, this is the first and only so far Lamar Building or Site designation we have done that is just for infrastructure. This is the iconic uh, reinforced concrete bridge between the Ormwood Park and Grand Park neighborhoods in Southeast Atlanta. This will become part of the Southeast Atlanta Beltline corridor in the in the coming years. A, a great example of how what seemingly everyday objects can become historically significant or be at least recognized as that officially by the city of Atlanta. Our last designation to talk about that's uh, recently been completed is the Smith Farm LBS. This is at the Atlanta History Center. This is significant and different for the city of Atlanta because it involves relocated buildings, which traditionally are not able to be considered designated as eligible, his, eligibly historic. It has its own educational history and it's a community resource. And I would note that the, the great thing about this property is that while the buildings, several of them are um, significantly older than the creation of the Smith Farm at the Atlanta History Center, in fact, from the 1800s, they have acquired, acquired their own significance do their educational um, activity in the city of Atlanta. So the Smith Farm was, was established as an as a educational facility at the History Center in the 1970s. So that means that the buildings in the, in, the, in the collection of those buildings and the activities that go with it have themselves acquired their own historic significance in their relocated state uh, because of this educational activity at the History Center. I wanna switch gears now and talk about our, our next programmatic uh, project, which is the LGBTQ Historic Context Statement. As folks might know, historic contexts are, are used by local governments and the federal government, National Park Service, to establish historic significance for thematic topics in the city or area. Um, so this would be uh, very much along those lines. It would be focused on the, from the mid 1900s to the present day on the LGBTQ history in the city of Atlanta, with these particular five topics highlighted, including the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s, harassment and bar raids and lawsuits by the Atlanta Police Department in particular, all throughout that time period. And then the very early foundings of the city's LGBTQ communities 
in the city of Atlanta. Um, there's a there's a longer history, at least that was clear to me when we started talking with folks about this, than what you might expect to find in, in Atlanta and in the South in general. This will provide guidance to the city of Atlanta and the state historic preservation office about how to identify these kinds of resources and also how to classify them and register them on the National Register of Historic Places and potentially through the city of Atlanta's designation underneath the city's preservation ordinance. My last two updates, our last couple updates, I should say, is a quick uh, review of our quick start implementation work from last summer. Um, these were about 10 activities that were identified in the Future Places Project as needing additional research. Uh, using some money we had in our office, we were able to do research on um, all but three of those activities to get our efforts sort of kick-started in that regard. Um, so we will be pursuing these more diligently this year and next year on how to get these um, off the books and into the real world as far as uh, seeing those as part of the city's historic preservation activities, including a photography contest, student design challenge, a fellowship, kiosks, uh, tools for designation, um, mapping programs, all the things you see here. We're very excited about getting these, taking these to the next, next level. Two last uh, implementation updates uh, that we created last year was our first historic preservation week. Um, we continued that uh, tradition this year in October um, for historic preservation week 2021 and we anticipate making this an annual event for the foreseeable future. This is uh, scheduled for October because it provides a nice uh, bookend, if you will, to uh, National Historic Preservation Month, which occurs in May, which is the time period of our uh, annual design awards program run by the Urban Design Commission for over 40 years. Historic Preservation Week includes both collection of speakers as well as educational activities and seminars. And we hope um, with all things going well to have this be an in-person event this coming fall and expand the opportunities for collaboration and networking um, through this activity. Uh, last, but last, neat, last but not least, I wanted to highlight the creation of the Atlanta Cemetery Network. This in fact will be kicking off February 24th of uh, next week. So this will be um, an opportunity for folks who are concerned about Atlanta cemeteries, both those that are well known and maintained as well as those that have been abandoned and forgotten. Um, a, a place for those folks to come together and facilitate conversations about what to do about the cemeteries, how to raise awareness, how to raise money, how to uh, provide stewardship opportunities for those cemeteries. And we think this will be a great way to highlight what are amazing spaces in the city of Atlanta and make them more part of their neighborhoods and um, you know the culture and identity of those of those places. I would note that all of these implementation efforts, and I want to really emphasize this, all the implementation efforts have been reliant on new and renewed partnerships to get these done. All of the designations were done with partners. The LGBTQ historic context statement is only being uh, you're coming to life because of a conversation with the Historic Atlanta and their efforts to lead that activity. We've also partnered with the Atlanta Preservation Center and Atlanta History Center and Historic Oakland Foundation have make all these things come to fruition. So we are looking for additional partnerships um, and um, we, we hope that presentations like this will help us lead to those kind of conversations and have more and more activities uh, be implemented from the Future Places Project. And with that, I'll conclude my presentation and turn it over to Dr. Tate. Thanks so much, Doug. That was fantastic. A lot to unpack. Um, I had a question if a recording was going to be available. Uh, yes, the recording and the presentations uh, will be available on the LUCC webpage. I've put a link to that in the chat. Uh, so without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Tate. And good morning, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yes. OK, great. And go to the next slide. Doug, thank you so much for your, your work and, and the city's work on preservation uh, writ large and also with the Future Places Project of which um, I've helped a little bit and also with Historic Atlanta. Uh, but today, this morning, I'm representing Culture Centers International, which is the nonprofit organization that I created um, for African-American preservation of corridors of memory here in Atlanta, um, primarily, uh, but certainly could go national. Uh, the thought of being an Atlanta native and having family uh, have graduated from 
the uh, various Atlanta University Center schools and walking those campuses uh, and driving uh, from my home to downtown Atlanta and seeing these buildings uh, just brought me from an art historian uh, to become a historic preservationist of, of my history and culture uh, and have found it to wanting and in doing that have found that it's everybody's history and culture. And so here I um, start off with a historic image of Stone Hall um, with north and south on either side. You see the smoke coming out of the chimney, the iconic clock tower. Uh, and this space uh, in Atlanta was known as Diamond Hill, um, highest elevation uh, in Atlanta and where Atlanta University chose to, um, to build educational um, buildings uh, for African-Americans uh, post uh, the Emancipation Proclamation. Next slide. And we also know from this building and its national landmark designation that um, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois was a faculty member at Atlanta University and had an office in Stone Hall, now Fountain Hall, uh, and actually wrote The Souls of Black Folks, published in 1903, uh, as his office looked down on what we now know as the Mercedes-Benz Stadium, but looking towards downtown Atlanta uh, and asking you know, the question of the problem of the 21st century and the color line. Next slide. Um, but we as preservationists and um, have gone into the building and this we have um, found out is his office and want to preserve it. Um, and so you see here um, Ben Sutton and our historic preservationists uh, from a grant and C.D. Moody, you know, um, looking through the building and, and getting prepared to make this heavy lift. Next slide. But the building is, is full of rich history as we combed the archives and found um, some exciting photographs here of African-American troops in front of this ivy-colored iconic arch of Fountain Hall steps, you know, you know, preparing for World War I. Next slide. To the Atlanta University Center, offering uh, Shakespeare on the steps. And um, we see these same doors uh, that we can see today and the actors, um, African-American and noting in history that this was an African-American woman, uh, Adrian Herndon, who uh, was a faculty member at Atlanta University and the wife of um, Atlanta's first millionaire, Alonzo Herndon, who's home is right here in this neighborhood. Next slide. And so Adrian, um, we've lifted up in several histories through Culture Centers International and a partnership with um, our artist, Charmaine Minifield, who will speak out next. Uh, and so a mural of Adrian is on the belt line. Uh, here she's pictured with her husband and only son, Norris. Uh, but also art has come uh, into the project, uh, lifting a photo of Atlanta University Center faculty, um, which, as we know, of the Atlanta University schools, um, many of them were, <clears throat> all of them were founded by, uh, initially by whites, um, but within kind of experiments where it was illegal uh, to have integrated education but you had white teachers, <clears throat> excuse me, teaching um, African American uh, students with their kids. And here's a group photo of those faculty members, which includes and, and uh, supporters. So Alonzo Herndon is over here to the left, and the third, I'm sorry, the 
third uh, person on the back row from the right is, um, sorry, the fourth is Dr. W.B. Du Bois. So we see these um, faculty member coming together um, and would have taken this picture on the steps of Fountain Hall. And uh, Dr. Karshik Sims Alvarado uh, did a photo mural of those faculty members um, to bring attention to the history of this um, iconic, but at that point vacant building. Next slide. I also want to mention um, John Hope, uh, who was the first uh, African American president for Atlanta University. Um, you know, and so again, we see these um, steps towards progress of again, having our HBCUs, uh, Af um, historically black colleges and universities, uh, changing of guards, so to speak, of um, the administration of the school being run by an African-American. But initially, Atlanta University, um, EA Ware and the, and the school that's in the neighborhood um, were um, named for the missionary who, um, who came from uh, the North from Yale to, to help with these uh, Freedmen's Bureau's um, education program. Next slide. Okay, next slide, please. I'm sorry, there might be a delay. Okay. I think we've skipped a slide, but um, I'm sorry about that. No problem. I have it on Fountain Hall. Is that correct? Okay. This, yeah, sorry right about here. That. Right here. No problem. And so here again, we've seen it referred to Fountain Hall. We know it historically as Stone Hall. And so, just a reminder of the history of the building that initially uh, it was in the ownership of Atlanta University. Atlanta University um, merges with Morehouse and Spelman to become the graduate division. Um, and so those three schools, they vacate this building, move to their current location. Uh, and so these buildings were vacant sort of late 1920s. Um, Morris Brown, next slide. was founded in 1882, sorry, 1881 uh, on, and its location, initial location was in, um, off of Boulevard. Um, but when these buildings became vacant uh, and Morris Brown was going through some financial troubles, came to um, merge with the, into the Atlanta University Center uh, to really become the largest conglomeration of HBCUs in the country. And Morris Brown, of all of the, the schools in the center, was the only one, it was an um, African Methodist Episcopal AME affiliated school, so founded by African Americans for African Americans. And so here you see the, um, the archway of Morris Brown in, uh, from the class of 58 that walks into the quadrangle uh, towards Fountain Hall. Next slide. So this rich history, um, as I mentioned, uh, was sort of rooted in family stories as well. Um, my great grand, great uncle attended Morris Brown, have an aunt, great aunt who attended Atlanta University and then parents and grandparents who um, met and married on Clark colleges and Clark University's campuses. So these buildings were not only historic to Atlanta, but 
a personal passion of my own. And so here you see an image of the building. Um, I was working with the it, um, ASALA, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, um, and knew of their work with the National Park Service. Um, 2016 uh, was the 100th anniversary of the Park Service, and so knew of these grants and said um, I would put forth the effort to uh, bring some of this funding to restore, as they say, our uh, rich history of Atlanta's, um, as they say, from civil war to civil rights story. Next slide. Um, we began the project with the um, Morris Brown College focus group and had uh, community events such as a you know, fall festival in front of the, um, the building to bring attention and awareness to this need to bring this um, really iconic structure back online, 39,000 square feet, um, massive clock tower, um, chapel space, library, uh, lots of classrooms. And, and so again, that rich history of Morris Brown had not been recorded. So as Doug has mentioned, we knew the, you know, the distant history of W.B. Du Bois being in the building. Uh, but since Morris Brown's you know, occupying the space have not recorded all of the stories and, and civil rights um, history, um, more recent history. And so that's what uh, we set out to do. Next slide. So as I say, you saw the building before, the clock tower, um, we were able to, um, to amass a total of um, over $1.5 million in grants for this project so far. Um, created a website um, with that first grant uh, as a preservation um, application, put a new roof on the building. Might be a little difficult to see, but they're copper downspouts. They don't come all the way to the ground because again, copper's a, a rich resource and we did want um, it to be stolen off the building, but going back to the original materials uh, that were used, uh, we wanted it to be as authentic as possible. The, the also the roof materials um, were slate, but this is a synthetic slate material that was um, that we were able to um, put on the on the building uh, that has over a fifty year uh, lifespan. So the look. Um, is historic, uh, but the modern materials, again, um, help, will help Morris Brown to maintain this building um, as it moves forward. And we all know that, you know, just as the roof of your house, the roof of a you know, historic structure um, now has, um, we're able to dry it out and start working on the rest of the rest of the project. But we finished this up last, uh, this past summer. Uh, and so excited uh, to report that uh, advancement. Next slide. And in the fall, um, again, as I mentioned, you know, this is uh, not just Culture Centers International, but a group of Morris Brown dedicated alumni who've been in the trenches since the school um, lost its accreditation in 2003 and forced to as they say, board up the building and, and walk away, thinking that they would be coming back, but then some 20 years later, here we are. Um, but they have been in the trenches from, from day one supporting it. But um, every homecoming, they're in front of the building and it's just an exciting, excited group. Uh, and as you see behind me, we have um, what we call Fourth Friday Fellowships. Uh, with Fountain Hall and many of the affinity groups uh, share their stories of um, weddings that happen in the chapel, um, meeting a future wife at the water, water fountain, uh, stories of the bell and the clock uh, and how uh, faculty would not let you into their classroom if the bell was ringing and you were late. So all of these fun stories really brought life to um, to something that was just bricks and 
you know, and mortar. But now we have these, the stories of what happened and, and the importance of this building to the campus and the, and the community. Vine City, um, we've had um, talks with Cosmopolitan Church and the like, uh, and, and learning about Morris Brown students that were active in the community and they would hear the bell, uh, hear the band practicing, um, you know, or the football players that would, would make a difference with the kids in the community. So all of this um, has been recorded. Next slide. And with that um, first grant, again, being able to walk up to the interior of the clock tower, we saw it from the outside, uh, but on the left, you see the original um, mechanism, the, the wheel that um, made the bell ring. Uh, and then over the years, it had um, stopped working and there was a striker that was uh, just hitting the bell to make the tones. Uh, but um, after restoration and cleaning, uh, we've been able to put a new uh, harness. Uh, the bell, the bell stayed, but the all of the um, accessories were re um, recast um, by the bell by bell company in the north, and then brought back and assembled in the clock tower. So now this um, the bell will actually swing uh, once the clock, and we bring power to the to the building. So. It's there and, and, and ready. And the exciting part of it is again, the bell was originally minted in 1889 um, uh, by a first congregational church in Massachusetts. Uh, and on that bell, it uh, is written without regard to sex, race, or color. And it really makes a difference when you know this and hear this sound that you know, the city of Atlanta can come together on this piece of history and really talk about the um, collaboration of races to, to uplift all and uplift Atlanta. Next slide. And so I end with this. This is, a, as you say, a drone view of our historic Fountain Hall, this corridor of memory, Martin Luther King Jr. Drive, and how historic preservation um, you know, is a bridge to the past, but also a bridge to the future as we go down this corridor and know that Haskell's um, West Hunter Street Baptist Church, the Gaines Hall, the Ashby Street Theater, that all of these are historic African-American sites of memory um, that tell the city's growth and development. And we look forward to you know, bringing funds and resources to map out this history along with the histories of other uh, corridors in the city and working, working with Doug and the, and the rest of the, of the team. Thank you. And I conclude with, you know, we're, we're always looking for money and, and um, every dollar helps. Uh, the website is fountainhallatl.org. Um, if you're interested in keeping up with the progress of the project, um, but I look forward to uh, answering questions and you know how Culture Centers International has worked with Fountain Hall. Uh, we also are, are working with Charmaine Minifield and the Praise House Project, and look forward to um, turning it over to you, Charmaine. Thank you so much, Dr. Tate. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, um, you're happy to answer questions. We've only gotten one so far in the chat. So uh, please feel free to put those questions and comments in the chat throughout um, the final presentation by um, uh, Charmaine Minifield. And um, we'll get to those um, at the final Q&A. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Charmaine. I believe we've got a video. Charmaine, I don't know if you wanna say any words before we queue that up. Um, no, welcome. We're gonna, we're, what you're going to see is, I guess I should put context, you're about to see the interior projection of the Praise House um, that we created for Oakland Cemetery. And it's a beautiful way to be an artist in spaces like these to bring you right into the art. So I'm going to go ahead and let it play. Mm -hmm. 
It runs for almost seven minutes. So get cozy and enjoy it. Uh...
Thank you. Yes, you can play the slides. The Praise House Project began with a public art presentation of this replica of a praise house in Oakland Cemetery to honor first the unmarked graves that were discovered there. 879 souls from Slave Square were displaced in 1866 by order of the Atlanta City Council at that time to make room for white citizens in what was the expanding footprint of Oakland Cemetery. We were displaced over a flooded hill and that mistreatment led to our losing Atlanta's first African-American ancestors um, in our city our, among our labor force. Because of that continued mistreatment in 1886, Southview Cemetery was founded. Nine once enslaved, now freed businessmen founded Southview Cemetery. And it sits on a rolling hill in South Atlanta. In 1906, on September 22nd, white mobs destroyed that community, which was at that time called Brownsville, targeting that community because of the intentional, the intention of interrupting economic potential for that black community. The Praise House Project will premiere at Southview on Juneteenth of 2022, this coming year, this coming summer, as a way to call in, like the ring shout would, like the praise house itself was intended, a gathering place. We want to gather resources back into that community as an act of resistance against erasure. Remembrance as resistance is the theme of the Praise House Project. We want to mount praise houses in places of remembrance where there was erasure of Black people, bodies, potential, Black futures. We want to invite and gather resources. Praise houses were safe spaces where we would gather, where could community would come together. In spite of the efforts to dismantle community, we created praise houses. We couldn't have our drums. That was a form of communication. So we made the praise house and it became our communal drum. The entire room was a instrument, the entire structure. If you could play my slides as I'm talking, it's fine. So people can see a praise house. Thank you. As you entered into the praise house, you stand along the walls in circle. This was before pulpit and pews. And we would find community and harmony with our voices. And we would tune the room. At the beginning of the video, you heard a long, slow type of music that was called um, metered hymn. That's a tradition that's also um, being lost. We would play and sing this music together in harmony, harmonizing, tuning the room, making community. When the beat would change, we would all move. The entire room of us would move. Spinning, singing, call and response, full body prayer. We became one. That was the ring shout. That was the ring shout. And that tradition comes out of Africa and African ritual and ceremony. So the act of the ring shout itself 
was an act of resistance. We were remembering ourselves. So for me, within my work, I center the ring shout as a symbol of remembering ourselves in the face of erasure, remembering each other, creating community when there is an effort otherwise, whether it's gentrification or time because of the endangering of our historic site. We call instead, we recall instead the ring shout. And we want to emulate the ring shout in community. At Southview Cemetery, the historic site of Southview, the historic site of Southview does not have the resources like Oakland Cemetery. It has no perpetual care fund. It needs restoring. We, the, rather than how the praise house was at Oakland Cemetery marking the end of the restoration of the African-American burial grounds. The Praise House at Southview will begin the efforts of restoration. We are hopeful that the Praise House can be in multiple communities here forward. After mounting at Oakland Cemetery with flux projects, we have been able to attract the support of multiple partners across multiple sectors and the funding of the Our Town Grant for the National Endowment for the Arts. The Our Town Grant will pay for the Praise House at Emory University, where we will consider and review Emory's history with slavery and dispossession. Here we have a chance to look at an institution's role in perpetuating a foundation of white supremacy and how that has affected the development and history of a city. We also get to consider how the founding of Emory displaced an entire generation and community of indigenous peoples. The matching funds for the National Endowment for the Arts grant come from DeKalb County, who has agreed to host the Praise House in celebration of its centennial 200 year anniversary. And in honor of Beacon Hill, the African-American freedman's town that once was before Decatur, removed by an Urban Renewal Act. Shotgun houses destroyed, land once owned by Black families now turned into a, to, um, uh, I can't remember the term. <laughs> Affordable housing is not the term, but we know that the slang term is the projects. They had to pay rent in these projects and they were displaced and that town was erased. We've already made connections to some of those descendants and the Praise House of Decatur will honor that history. I'm an alumna of Agnes Scott. I'm an alum of Agnes Scott, and I know the history of Beacon Hill because the earliest employees of Agnes Scott lived in Beacon Hill. The men worked at George Washington Scott's fertilizer mill off of Panthersville in South DeKalb and were paid with molasses. The women of Beacon Hill worked at Agnes Scott. I have always committed to remembering their contributions and their history in Decatur. And I have an opportunity to. We are right now raising the funds to mount the Praise House at Southview. Um, we have great partnerships that exist where we'd also like to see 
the resources that we pull into that community having long standing impact on the planning of that community that we can affect change in the areas of diversity and inclusion and, and the security of home ownership, business investment, education, and historic preservation of our legacy in South Atlanta. That is the effort that I am actually working on with Dr. Candy Tate. And it's an honor to work with her and CCI, Culture Centers International, along with her work at the Atlanta University Center. Clark Atlanta was founded in this community in South Atlanta near Southview Cemetery. Um, we want to look at these moments in Atlanta's history and remember them in a way that ensures a just and equitable future moving forward. My work as an artist activist is to recall these stories and recall these histories in a way that affects change today. So I hope you come, <laughs> I hope you support. You can find out more at the praisehouseproject.org. Um, and please, this is Black History Month, find out the history of Southview Cemetery. This is where Dr. King was first laid, where Congressman Lewis was recently laid. Um, and to rest. Um, find out the history of those who were enslaved um, and buried originally in Slave Square at Oakland Cemetery. We have those ledgers. We have those ledgers. We know their names. Also, there are amazing resources throughout our whole partnerships, both the Emory Center, uh, Rose Library and Marble um, Library with rare books and archives as well as their uh, database on the slave ship voyages archives and database. We want to track and map all the way home these ancestors. I had the pleasure of spending time in the Gambia unexpectedly during quarantine. And I was able to bring research from the Gambia <laughs> to this work tracking the origins of the ring shout. And we want to continue to build bridges in our historic preservation work, in our, in our actual um, research and, and, and genealogy work, in our educating around archives and, and preserving our intellectual property, you know, as acts of restoration and repair. We want to build those resources for families to trace their origins all the way back, we hope, to Africa <laughs> as a global effort of, of uniting our contemporary generation to always preserve Black narratives, past, present, in order to ensure our future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Charmaine. Um, powerful as ever. I really appreciate it. All right, if I could have Doug and Dr. Kate join us. Dr. Tate, I conflated Candy and Tate and called you Dr. Kate. <laughs> um, I'd love to just take the last uh, 10 minutes or so and, and, and talk through some questions. We've got one question from the audience, um, but I wanted to, um, I know Dr. Tate has a hard stop. Um, and she might need to, to leave a little bit before 1030. So I thought we could save that question for, for closer to the end um, because I really wanted to um, start off with uh, a question that I had. Um, the recent, I say recent, although it's been um, a couple of years now, um, racial justice movements have um, been very important for the community development group at ARC in terms of how it has impacted our programming um, how it's impacted, how we talk about planning, um, how it's affected uh, communities of color, and what we, um, you know, plan on doing about it. And I'd love to really talk to you all about and hear from you all about how you all feel it has changed how we, the universal we, talk about preserving 
um, historically and culturally significant sites of African and African American heritage. And I noticed this sort of trend, Doug, you mentioned this sort of uptick in, in um, uh, landmark designation over the last couple of years. And I, I'm sure that's just due to um, this fantastic planning process on your part, but I also noticed some of those were African American sites of, of, of importance. Um, this uh, Praise House project really took off. Um, and I'm wondering if any of that has to do with this sort of the surge of, of energy um, that has come about from the racial justice movements. I'd just love to hear a little bit about that, the impact it might have had for you all well, in your work. I, I, I think that I can, I can respond, that's okay. Um, I, I think that in this country, and I get, I get a chance to say that because I was in the Gambia <laughs> and I was watching from there. Um, in this country, there's the George Floyd, the death of George Floyd, it called for a, re a, a, a reckoning that rippled through our entire generation that wasn't just in this country. It became a global movement. And now that I've returned from this perspective, I can feel I, I'm experiencing a heightened level of, of um, uh, emotion, like collective universal emotion around that reckoning. And there, there is a generation now that of, of young activists that are not going to see white supremacy continue, <laughs> that I, I pause and give and acknowledge and support. Um, I have a wall of Ella Baker in on Auburn Avenue, and I used her words the whole time watching the uprisings that we should give the reins to the young who are not afraid not afraid to go into the storm, you know. And so there is this new surgence, and then on an institutional level, as we raise money for the South Peace Cemetery. Praise House and uh, build resources among institutions to remember um, our history. There, it feels there. I'm seeing a lot of language around this this reckoning. Uh, we're also facing anniversaries. The anniversary of the union is at 2026. 20, um, you know, uh, we're finding slave enslaved folks cemeteries. At, at, at institutions in the South that we have to acknowledge that now, how do we preserve or, um, you know, I think reckon with that disparity of, uh, of how these institutions perpetuated the, that disparity of resources and opportunity over generations that contribute to the disparity today in, in these communities where those who were, who were employed or not employed, enslaved in some cases by these institutions and where they fare and their descendants compared to the generational wealth of both individuals, but also you know, institutional generational wealth. You can see the disparity between those communities and that history is blaring in the South. Though we have beautiful, progress and amazing features to our physical landscape, we have this undercurrent of history that still has to be reckoned with and it expresses in police brutality. It expresses in systemic racism it, that, that this generation is not gonna, <laughs> is, it, they are not having it. It is going to be called out. And we're, we're, we as, as their elders, I'm going ahead and honoring that, are in a position to support and, and, and correct within those institutions that we've been a part of, or we are, I've been excluded from in some cases, and in, in, in especially within this context. I think that's just literally what time it is. And it's across the line, government to private, to religious, to education system, every, it's, we, it, that's what time it is. And this revisionist history that we've all been sort of functioning with is no longer the, it's not accepted. You know, it's not accepted. 
and you know, there's many aspects I think also of that came that have come to light because of our political climate and our political climate becoming very polarized within some of these racial um, issues, these issues around race and, and inequity. And that became language and folly within propaganda that exposed a deeply rooted, you know, cavern <laughs> of divide between ideas that aren't always racial, you know, on race lines. Like all people of one color do not feel the same way. Like, but deeply rooted, it comes from these early histories of, you know, in some cases, you know, terror, trauma, erasure, displacement, um, you know, and then this, these monuments of grandeur that remain still on, very much in our landscape. And what, how does that inform the ethics of our day, you know? And Charmaine, as you're, as you're sharing that, it's making me think of, of course, like the, the Henry Grady statue where, you know, three bodies were heaped in front of it right there on Marietta Street or, you know, or the need to rename uh, schools and buildings. And so some of this history and propaganda um, that uh, we call art uh, is now coming down. And so let's do due diligence and correct that history and narrative um, all the way back to our indigenous, and, you know, our Native American brothers and sisters um, to the, you know, to present. So we're, we need to have this flow in and out of historical memory to more recent memory of um, the LGBTQ plus community and how we are going to acknowledge uh, everyone and their part in making America. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Doug, did you want to add anything? Um, I, I just wanted to note that to, to your original question, Molly, that that, that the city of Atlanta um, uh, has a lot of interest, renewed interest, I should say, in highlighting African American history in particular. Um, you'll notice that the most recent designations, a couple of them, did focus on that. We have two actually that are still in process that I didn't include in my PowerPoint, but I'll mention here today. They're not they're not a secret or anything by any means, but um, one is uh, St. Mark Amy Church structure in uh, English Avenue will be nominated uh, very shortly for landmark building or site status. And then the other one, which is also fascinating, is um, the Philadelphia Baptist Church School Building just off Cascade Road in, in Southwest Atlanta. Um, mm -hmm. This is the building that stands today is the uh, current um, uh, you know, uh, iteration of a reconstruction era educational effort by the congregation of folks that were in Cascade Road uh, area at the time in, in the uh, late 1800s after the Civil War. So um, we're very interested in that, in, in those two uh, outcomes. We're hoping to, to announce those, you know, officially, if you will, relatively soon. We're just trying to wrap up some of the research on those in partnership with both the property owners in the church and the latter of the two cases. Um, but I think I wanted to touch on what, what both Charmaine and Dr. Tate noted here, which is the idea of the, of the um, remembrance and culture and identity question. Um, one of the things that is really important, I think, to the city, and it was somewhat embodied in the Future Places Project, is to push back on the um, accepted, if you will, quote unquote, narrative about what the city of Atlanta is and how it came to be. Um, and I think it's real important for folks to, to folks to remember that um, those that narrative and how how it uh, has been quote unquote accepted by the vast majority of folks in Atlanta um, are based on conscious decisions by folks in the past to present that as the narrative. Mm -hmm. um, there's a some some folks I think uh, seem to think that it's just the way it is. And um, it's always important to remind folks that those were decisions made in the past to create what we see today, both physically and culturally in the city of Atlanta. And why that's equally important in a conversation like what we're having today is that that also means that there's empowerment to make those same decisions about what happens in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you know someone made a decision in the past to create a narrative we have today, then that gives you the right and the authority to have that decision about what happens from this point forward. 
And that both deals with physical spaces, which is often the city's main concern, at least it has been for the recent past, um, but also um, understanding the layering of the histories that go with the space. So it's not necessarily the first story that you hear or the first narrative that you've been exposed to that is the complete picture of a place or space. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, we are coming up on time. I don't know, if Doug, did you want to speak to um, the question about the Chattahoochee uh, brick yard at all? I did respond to it in the chat, right. but the, the short answer is that the city is still working on this due diligence effort in that regard. I'm not uh, privy to all the details about that, but um, it's still in process, I guess is the best way to say it. All right, wonderful. And we've got a, a, a thank you. Um, Oh, this is and Molly. Uh, I'm, I'm smiling because we want to bring the praise house to Chattahoochee Brit. Yeah, oh, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Yes, yeah. yes. We're interested in making that happen. We'd love to do it. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Just uh, encourage uh, my speakers today to to look at that um, beautiful thank you from Caitlin there in the chat there. Um, but I, it's 10.30. Uh, I've, I have so many more questions, but we are out of time. Um, thank you, thank you everyone for being here today. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, and I uh, hope you have a wonderful Wednesday and a wonderful rest of your week. Thanks, Molly. Bye everyone. Thank you for hosting, Molly. Thank you, Molly. Thank you.